now. This video will continue from where we left off in the modification and cleaning process. I'll process this photo from start to finish and see what constitutes a workflow for this type of image and what the individual workflows entail and how to combine everything we've learned so far to produce amazing results. As before, I'll make a note of all the things that impress me and what I want removed so that we can emphasize the things we like and remove the ones we don't like. We'll remove and adjust this part here, which looks like a blotch because it's too light and shouldn't be that light in that area of her hair. We'll remove and adjust this part here, around the mouth, and this part of the chin. As you can see, there's a discrepancy between the light and the dark, and the light spots look like a blotch. We'll correct the lips. We will definitely remove this part of the model's hair that draws my eyes and does nothing to make the image look better. We'll adjust the shape of the body. The hair in this part. We will correct this part here under her eyes. I will begin the healing process using the automatic tool. And if I see that it's not working well enough, I'll switch to a healing brush, the tool with which I can manually choose where to get the textures from. It's very important for this process to give it the necessary time, which is different depending on different pictures, so that you can eliminate as many flaws as possible. Depending on how much time we spend on this process, we'll subsequently have less to do with dodge and burn. And dodge and burn takes up a good deal of our time in our workflow, because with it, we work on a micro level with small areas, though that's exactly what makes our photo look really good. It's important to look at the photo from close up and from afar to compare and make sure that we won't miss something by looking at texture alone. Because when we look closely, we see mostly texture, and when we look at something from afar, we see light and dark shades, color and contrast. That way, we see better where we should dodge and where we should burn the image. I'll continue to create the dodge and burn layers that I mentioned earlier which will make the light parts darker and the darker parts in the image lighter, so that we can balance and even out those micro parts of the skin. I'll rename the group Dodge and Burn. To tidy it up and continue by selecting the burn layer and start blending the lights and areas of the model skin. Most people almost always start this process with the dodging, or in other words, with the brightening. But I'll start with the burning, i.e. make the areas I choose darker. And then, if necessary, continue with the process with dodging and lighten up what is too dark to even out the skin. Over time, I found that this is one of the small things that is better to begin with the burning process, and then later lighten up the areas that you want. Because if we start with the brightening first, then the skin will become too artificial and it will look blatantly worked on. For this type of portrait photo, the idea of which is to have a natural looking classic portrait. Our work won't be as much as it would with beauty photos and shouldn't take more than an hour or so to process. It's not a lot of work, but we need to pay enough attention to every small detail in order for the result to be really good. The idea of this photo, and of our whole vision we've created at my workshop, is of naked makeup, i.e. as if the model is without makeup and their makeup artist has not emphasized the makeup and the performance of the hairdresser, but rather the model themselves, which really gives quite nice results.
The whole idea here is what the model will give us as an expression and as for an emotion. In my opinion, we did a pretty good job with this classic portrait. We were really able to show what the person standing in front of the camera truly is. And the interesting thing about these pictures is that everyone interprets and may perceive the photos differently, depending on what the vision he or she has as an artist. You can see that in the help group, I have several layers of screen and one of multiply. I use these brightening layers to open up the shadow areas and see better the darker parts of the image. And I can see what's going on there and adjust even the darkest parts, because even if they aren't visible, they still need to be adjusted to a lesser extent in order to avoid color distortion and for the shadows to be blended well. I deliberately chose these freckle model shots because these photos are much harder to work with. With these shots, we have to take into account not only the light we have in the image, but also the texture of the skin. The model has a lot of freckles, and due to this, our work will be much more difficult. For this, as I said, we won't look at the image in close up, but we'll try to look at it from as far away as possible so we can see what the dark and light areas in the image actually represent and correct them. Again, when we're looking at the image in close-up, we work with mostly texture, and looking at the image from afar is when we work with the light in the image. With this type of portrait, as I said, it's permissible to have more flaws because this will make our image seem more authentic and true, and we want our image to be as natural as possible. Here, we won't try to have the model look perfect from every point of view. The work of the makeup artist, hairdresser, and the person behind the camera is not emphasized. We want to emphasize the work with the model, the expression she or he will give us. I think this part of the image, around the model's chin, needs some more work to make it look even better. And after that, I'll rotate the photo using R on the keyboard to brighten up this side of her lips, that I want to make even smoother. When I dodge, I'm trying to work between the freckles and brighten the part of the skin between them, so I don't lighten them up, but only the distance between them. When I'm working on the burn layer and darkening the skin of the model with freckles, I don't try to go between them too much, because even if they get darker, it's not a problem. Because then they'll be even more visible and distinct, which is good. I think I'll have to work a little more on this site later, but for now, it seems good. I'll continue by turning off the help group, and then slightly increase the shadow under the lower lip, which will add even more depth to this part. That seems okay to me.
Note that under the eyes, I don't remove it 100%, and I keep what we have in the photo fairly close to the original. Otherwise, if I removed everything, it would make our photo look fake. Notice that I work very gently and carefully under the eyes, so I don't remove it 100% from what the model has underneath this. The idea is not to be removed, but to be blended between light and dark. I'm enhancing the line of her eyelid by contouring it so it can stand out. I rotate the picture to make it easier for me to move the hand. Because when I rotate it, this way I only have to make vertical movements, and not vertical and horizontal ones. This way is much more natural for your hand movement. This is one of the reasons I recommend using a tablet. It's definitely a much easier way of working. And the other positive effect is that it speeds up the workflow. I'll brighten up this part here. I'll fade it once again. If the model didn't have so many freckles, I would most likely be working with a continuously activated help group. But since the model has a lot of freckles, and with a black and white assist group activated, it's much harder to tell if it's a blotch, a shadow, or a freckle. And for that reason, quite honestly, I often turn off and on that help group to compare it with and without it, whether it's a color or texture, or it's some stain that needs to be removed. I think in this photo, I'll change the colors a little bit later. Because looking at it, I think that if the image contains more red colors rather than yellow and adjust the color balance, it'll look better, but this is something I'll do at the end of the retouching process. Working with colors is a process which I leave at the end of the retouching process because if I have to modify the colors first and then retouch, there's a chance to distort the colors. Then I'll have to correct the color difference due to the retouch. I want to make the shape of the nose a little rounder, and for that I'll use Burn to do the same as with the 3D sphere we mentioned earlier, in the same way of the shape of the nose for the model. I'll also correct that light part in the hair, which is noticeable and distracting when viewed from afar. This group of several hairs stands out too much, so I'll correct it. I personally think it looks much better. I'll shed some light on that as well. Over time, you'll be able to notice more and more what's not apparent at a first glance. I'll use the shortcut Control S from time to time and save the image so that in case something happens, I still have a backup. The next thing I'm going to do is make a copy of everything I've created so far by pressing Control, Alt, Shift, and E. Then I'll sharpen it. The filter I'll use is Unsharp Mask. This will be my help copy. That way, 
I'll add a lot of sharp to the image so I can better see the differences on the model skin. And then create a new working group from Dodge and Burn and work on top of our help layer, which I just did. Doing that I don't need to zoom too much, preventing the image from overcorrection. And after choosing from where to start, I'll continue on this layer with the burning process again. The brightest part that's seen when looking at the picture from afar is this side of the model's lips, which, although I've worked on it, still needs some work. My brush settings are 20% opacity and 1% flow. I'll rotate the picture again and continue to work on the part where I'll blend these small differences. Changes to transitions must be slow and deliberate. Don't look for a way to change them in one go, because it's a process that's a combination of many small movements to make the change realistic. I could get a similar result with frequency separation, but in this case, we're limited here in its use, because the model has freckles and we'd like to keep them and not lose them which is something that would probably happen if we used frequency separation. Quite often I work at one place, then I go to another and then return to the first place again. The reason for this is that when looking at the same area for a long time, the eye gets used to it and it becomes increasingly difficult to tell what the difference is. Therefore, it's good to work in different places and return back to them, and, if necessary, to repeat this cycle. It's also good to rest on an hourly basis so as not to overburden the eye or get used to looking at the picture because then it's more likely that we become unable to distinguish the adjustments and differences we've made by looking at the image for too long a time. After I finish working on the areas I want to fix of this layer I created, I'll delete it. I'll reduce the opacity of the Dodge and Burn group by 40 or 50 percent because this group was intended only for the texture enhanced layer with the sharpening filter which helped me to see the small light differences on the model skin. And because I deleted it, this effect of this Dodge and Burn group will be too strong and that's the reason to reduce its opacity. We want to keep things natural. This little hack can be used when you have difficulty seeing flaws in your photo and can be used in both portrait and other genres of photography. This is a hack that I've come up with over the years and have never met anyone else who uses it. I'll fade this effect. Let's adjust this part under the eyes a little. So far I've worked on the burn layer and after darkening just a little bit more, I'll select the dodge layer and I'll start here by removing these light spots that I think look different from the area around them. I'll fade the last brush stroke once again. After that, I'll again select the darkening layer and make a few improvements with which I'll outline very slightly this line, which separates the model's face from the neck, thus creating depth and expressiveness. I won't make major changes 
because once I finish the basic process, I'll take the time to contour. But for now, I'll just enhance the model's cheekbone by adding some light and some small shadow below that to simulate the real cheekbone structure. I'll fade it a bit once more. You see, compared to the original, it looks much better. Notice how, with the help of light alone, I was able to make the nose a little bit rounder, and how I managed to make it really go into the shadow. Just like I did with the 3D sphere we worked on earlier. I'm also working on the edges of her face, because the idea is to go from light to dark, and even darker so it fades into the shadows and that way create drama into the portrait image using the contrast between the light and shadows. This can't be achieved using automatic tools because it won't look the same way, so we have to do it manually. I'll pay a bit more attention to this section. I raised opacity to 20% from 10 to work a little faster, because at 10% you have to go over the same place several times, while with opacity at 20% it'll probably only take once or twice. With opacity at 10%, it'll take me maybe 4, 5, 6 times as long and really extend our process without much improvement. I'll use burn on this part to make the transitions from light to dark parts even smoother. Then I'll darken the area under her right eye a little bit more. Then I will fade the last brush stroke to 5%. I'll darken it just a little bit more. Next, I'll select the dodge layer to balance the darks I have now made. I'll activate the second layer, which is on screen, in the help group, to lighten the image a bit more to reveal the darker parts so I can see better in the shadow area and remove this line which is very pronounced and too intrusive. I'll make the last touch at 10% and then choose a darkening layer and darken the places that look too bright. After removing the dark line to balance the differences, it's starting to look better. I'll compare my work with the original to see what I've done so far. Then, I'll make a copy and save the photo. Continuing, I'll adjust that part around the flower, fencing in the place and using feather to make the edges softer in the selection. Feather is an option that I use quite often to make selection borders softer and use the stamp tool to take content from a clean place and insert it in the missing area. And I use the stamp for this part 
because it not only adds color, but texture. There's plenty of area to choose from and replace. For similar tasks that don't have a lot of texture on top, and where the area is monochrome, I can also use a brush of the selected color. But the stamp adds pre-existing colors to the image, making it a better choice for similar tasks. I'll use the noise filter as I get close enough to see what's going on and try to simulate the already existing noise in the image. And I'm going to fade it at between 40 to 50 percent. In fact, even 35 percent looks good. And I'll put it on luminosity. That way, there won't be added additional color by this applied effect. This technique guarantees 100% preventing color shift from any effect from which you use it. Now I'm going to make a new layer, set on the color blending option, to add some color on this place. To me, it looks much better already. Now I want to look at what to remove afterwards. And so, to avoid changing the workflow, I'll continue with Dodge and Burn, starting in this section. I'm going to create a new Dodge and Burn group to continue working on the model skin. Because the effect was too intense, I reduced it by a bit. This will also fade it at 10%. Maybe I'll fade it a little more. Let's check out what I've done so far. I think this part of the head needs a little more work, but I can't see it well enough, so I'll use the help group as it lightens the dark areas so I can continue my work there. Now, I'll zoom out and work more globally with a larger brush to obscure the part under her eye. And a very little that part under her lips. I'll probably reduce this to 70%, then I'll merge them together in a single layer by pressing Ctrl E. Now I'll slightly brighten the light parts. I'll add a sample point on the image. Then I'll also add a dot into the curve's midtones and then I'll darken it a bit. And I'll use the curves channels to add a little red. Maybe a little yellow. And this whole effect, we'll keep it at 35%. Let me remove the sample point I made and compare the last two layers, so I can see what are the differences from the applied effects. Now. I need to look at the image and see what to look for and what to do next. And the thing that draws my eyes and annoys me is the hair of the model, from the part near the flowers. I'll select and duplicate only this part of the image, so I don't need to copy the whole layer. 
so the file isn't too heavy. Then I'll use Multiply on this layer to darken it, add a black mask, and start revealing only where I want to darken the image. But you can see that since I only copied one piece of the whole image, I can't reveal everything, because I start seeing the edges of this piece, therefore I have to work only on this part, that I'm sure I won't reveal its edges, and if I reveal any, I have to brush them with a black brush to hide them. I'll darken it a bit more. I'll also be careful not to darken the flowers. Maybe it would have been a better idea to duplicate the whole picture so I don't worry about any edges that can be left by the effect, but I want to keep the file size small, because I'm pretty sure I'll reach the file's limit size. I see here is something I want to fix, and to do this, I'll raise the brush hardness to 50% to keep the flowers intact. A little here, but I want to obscure it just a bit. I'll brush out this part where there might be some edges left from the layer which I worked on. I'll duplicate the whole layer and set it on multiply. I'll also darken the part above the head to give a smoother transition of the darker parts. But I think it may be a good idea to darken this part here, so I can make the model fade into the shadows a bit more. Now I'll merge them all together to keep everything organized. So definitely not having this strand keeps our eyes from being distracted, and we can focus on the model. I'll also remove these flying hairs. and the last brush stroke, I'll fade it at 50%. I'll bring them together and create a new group of dodge and burn. As I'm currently correcting the lips, these are obviously problems with the camera sensor, or some dust that I'll remove before using dodge and burn on the lips. I'll use the help group to better see what's going on in the dark parts, using a small brush to adjust what isn't seen at the first glance. I want to see what it looks like from afar to judge what to leave and what to remove. Working with the lips, and here's a subtle point. In most cases, the lips have to be as natural as possible. And we don't always have to have a perfect texture on them. Sometimes, the lips can be cracked, and we can't leave it, but we can't fix it because it looks weird. So we work very carefully on the lip area, which is sometimes easier to adjust with frequency separation to remove that part of the texture that doesn't look right. Luckily, this is not the case and we don't have too much work on our model's lips.
I'll rotate the photo again so I can see and work easily on this part of the side of the lips. I'll work some more on the dark part of the image, under her right eye. I'll fix this part too, because I would like to darken the light going to the inside of the lips. And I'll modify this section here a little bit more as well. This is the reason we say dodge and burn is a non-destructive process. Because as you can see, we were able to preserve the texture part as well, we didn't change it. I'll adjust that part of the lower lip a little more. It's important that the hardness of the brush is about 50%. And I'm going to make the upper lip a bit brighter. I'll set the effect at 8%. The shadows must transition very smoothly from light to dark. I'll pay some more attention to this part and adjust it a little bit more. And when I'm ready, I'll merge them together in one layer. Now I'll use the liquify filter to adjust her back so it looks better, making sure not to modify the background too much. I'll very carefully push the edges of the body to produce a smoother arc. You can see on the right what's the pressure, and in this case it's below 50%, and more specifically at 32. I changed the brush size with the large brackets, the keys to the right of the P key on the keyboard. I'll change the shape of the jaw very slightly. And again very slightly the nose. I'll also gently touch the chin and save it. Here are the differences, before and after. In fact, I'll also change the shape of the head a little, 
making it a little rounder so it doesn't have a strange shape up in the shadow. I'll pull this part slightly to the right, and we'll push this part from above slightly and carefully down. Maybe from above here. Maybe that's it here. Okay, I'm going to turn on the help group so I can see better what's in this dark part of the image. I'll remove this area here under the lip, but just a hair. I'll fade it a little. Maybe this part. Just again a percentage. Let's see what we've done so far. I'm going to make a new group for Dodge and Burn, and we'll do the contouring of the photo right now. I'll turn off one of the layers with the screen blending options, so it's not too light, and start by contouring the part above the lips first. I'll enhance the shadows a little bit more to create some more depth. I'll do the same thing on the lips both the upper and the lower lips. On the nose. I'll use a very small brush to enhance what is already dark to create more depth and contrast, different than what we get from sharpening the image with the sharp filter or any of the other sharpening techniques. I'll repeat the shape of the eye. And as before, I'll want to slightly lift the upper eyelid. And so it doesn't start looking fake, I'll use a larger brush. Very carefully. Trying not to change the shape of the eyebrow. Okay. Now let me continue by outlining those lines that will create more depth. I'll use both a small and a larger brush. I'll also slightly outline the eye on the inside. I'll begin by darkening the dark parts first, and seeing what happens as an effect, and will subsequently add light to the light parts of the iris of the eye. I'll do just a little bit to start, and then if I want, I can add more to make the effect stronger. I press Q to activate the Quick Mask option to see what I did and where the effect has been applied. I'll also strengthen the eyebrow a little.
Then I'll work on the glare in this eye. I'll also intensify these dark parts and the light parts of the eye. I recommend using less light in your eyes so it looks more natural. I'll rotate the picture and work on that inner part of the eye. Starting with the enhancement, the lights, and trying not to overdo the results that I will achieve. I'll also enhance the reflection of the studio light in her eye. And reduce the effect to 25%. I'll also increase the light of the lower eyelid. In general, I repeat what is light with dodge and what is dark with burn. I've worked on the dark parts of the lips. Now I'll work on the light parts of the model's lips. Starting with the brightening of the upper lip, and in all likelihood, I'll soon move on to the darkening. But first I'll go ahead and enhance the light parts. I'll remove this line. A little here. I'll also enhance the light and shadows on her right eye, as I did on her left eye. I'll darken the eyebrow a little bit more. Contouring is usually the final stage of the image process. I'll also outline the shoulder, but I'll make both horizontal and vertical lines that we will fade by a few percentage points, thus making the texture of the image a little different and not so repetitive. and then I'll make some circular motions. I'll use a large brush.
When I'm ready, I'll use the small brush again to work on this part around the model's lips a bit more. I'll also enhance the light portions of the nose And in the same way, I'll enhance the light portions in the hair of the model. Again, I work with a smaller brush to simulate the true light of the small individual hairs in the model's hair. If something seems to me to be too much of an effect, I can always fade it a bit. Hair should also be given enough attention, as the skin, because if the hair is not retouched and the hair is not lightened or darkened, it will be different and one will be noticeable more than the other. So it may need some small touches, but we still need to add light and contour to the hair. In the same way, I'll use burn to darken individual parts of the hair of the model so as to create a contrast between light and dark. I'll do the same thing with this part under the eyebrow and above the eyelid. To make that part more visible, trying not to overdo it. And, if that still happens, I'll eventually be able to scale it back a few percentage points. I'll rotate the image one more time to make it easier with this arc here and add some more light at the bottom below the mouth of the model. Wow, it looks good to me! Using Alt and click on the masks, you can see how the masks look after the working process. So far, I've achieved this as a result. This is everything I've done so far. This is before, and this is after. Before, after. To be honest, it seems to be too much as an effect, so I'll dial down some of what I just did. Now I want to make these tulips a little more red. And for this purpose, I'll use a mask. For this part, I'll use the brush below 50% hardness to know that these parts will flow well and there will be no boundaries that I'll have to work with and fix later. I'll also add that part to the mask. I'll make the brush a little stronger to work with the leaves. I'll use the color balance, and in the highlights I'll add some yellow and cyan and I'll add some warm tone to the mid-tones by adding some red and yellow colors. For the shadows, I'll add some blue and cyan 
to make them a bit cooler. That way, in the highlights, I'm adding warm colors, and I'm also adding some cooler tones in the shadows to create a color contrast to the image, and I'll fade the effect at 30%. I'm going to use curves to darken the flowers ever so slightly. I'll make them some more colorful in red. And keep this effect at 80%. I'll fix the mask with a harder brush excluding the area of the tulips to make it more precise, which was previously missed. I'll add some more white to the mask with a soft brush as well. Most likely, you will not have much work with dodge and burn with these smaller areas, because changing the colors in an image is one of the last phases which are made before the image is finalized. I'll reduce some of the red in the flowers, adding cyan with the color balance so they don't look so red. Next, I'll lighten up the eyes using shadows and highlights, and we will use this to work only on the eyes. I'll use a fairly soft brush so it doesn't leave any edges from the effect and even the size of the brush is slightly larger than usual. I'll check and see what I've done so far. What strikes me, however, is that the contouring of the inner part of the eye is too strong, and therefore, I'll dial back some of the effects I added to them. I'll first remove this area of the inner part of the eye, because the effect shouldn't be so strong there, and because the true power is in the small details, and sometimes, weaker effects are much more impactful. I'll dial it back a little more. I'll just keep a bit. Now I'll save it all and keep it in just one layer. This eyelash is too thick and big, so I'll make it less visible by removing it with the help of a spot healing brush and then fading it a percentage. In addition, I'll draw a few eyelashes. Though not with absolute black, I'll use the eyelash color already existing in the photo. To draw eyelashes, it's advisable to use a tablet because the movement of the hand is much like the shape of the eyelashes. And with a mouse, it'll be much harder for you to create realistic results. and I'll use less noise and will try to simulate that which already exists in the image.
I'll keep it at 50%. I'll activate the layer with the notes I've made to see if there's something I missed that I'd like to change. Let me see what I've noted. I'll take this part of the image and create a new layer. In fact, I'll remove those spots in the model's eyes before that. In this case, I'll use the stamp tool on an empty layer. When I'm done, I'll add some noise to match the already existing noise in the image. and fade it on 30 to 35% with the luminosity option selected. Now I can merge it with the layer below. I'll select this part I want to correct and duplicate it on a new layer and use the unsharp mask filter with the amount 35 and 35 radius thus creating a strong pixel contrast on the small areas to enhance the texture and the contrast of the individual pixels between the light and dark areas. But, I'll add a mask and apply this effect only on a low percentage on her eye. I'll merge this in one layer, and I'll use Unsharp Mask again, but this time the amount 100 and radius 2. I'll use the History Brush to work only on this part of the eye. I almost never use a sharpening filter on a model's skin, because it may look strange. Sharpen only where you want to attract the viewer's gaze. The next thing I would do is use the luminosity masks we talked about earlier, and with their help, we can make more contrast in the image. I'll select this mask and use the adjustments layer on screen. Then I'll create an inverted selection from the same mask. How to do that? Create a selection of this mask, holding Ctrl and click on the mask to activate a selection. Next, I'll invert the selection so I can select the darker parts by going to Select Inverse, which will invert my selection, and I'll add another adjustment layer on Multiply to darken the dark areas more. You can see now that the file has reached the 2 GB limit. As I said earlier, PSD files can reach up to 2 GB, and since this file has already reached this limit, if I want to keep what we've worked on so far, we need to save it in a separate file. In fact, let's do that now. When you save the new file, it will again be 2 GB. I save everything I've worked on so far, and now I'll delete this part, which includes the very first steps I made. Doing so allows me to free up space in the working file. This way, I'll have everything I worked on so far in the first file, and everything from here on out in the second. Let's continue with the working process. Since I want my lights to be a little brighter, I'll duplicate the layer and add some of the lights only in certain places with the help of a mask. I'll use a soft brush. I'll add it in this part of the flowers and in the hair.
I'll make some small movements with a large brush so I can add contouring because, as I said, contouring includes larger and rougher movements and in larger areas. I'll merge everything I've done so far in a new layer with the help of Control, Shift, Alt, and E to create a merged copy of the visible layers on a new individual layer. Now I'll show you a method with which you can see if the image is too saturated with color. Create a new layer of vibrance and saturation. Raise saturation to 100%, lower vibrance to minus 100, and that which remains as a residue is an area which is oversaturated, an excess of color. It may give you problems later, especially if you're planning to print the image. I'll show you how you can fix this oversaturated problem which you may have. What we can do for the moment is go through the channels of the image, which includes red, green, and blue, and choose the channel which is the brightest. In this case, this is the red channel. Select the whole channel with Ctrl A to select everything, then copy this channel with Ctrl C, paste it on a new layer with Ctrl V. You'll now have a black and white layer on which we have to create a black mask. I keep this black and white copy of the channel between the original image and the vibrance adjustment layer, and using the white brush, reveal from that layer on these areas, which are too saturated with color. Trying to create a little more balance between the light and the dark, the colorful and the not so colorful parts of the image. I have the opacity set to 10% and flow at 2%, because the change must be very slight. I'll reduce this at the model's eyebrow and on her head. Again, I'll use a bigger brush to cover larger areas because I'm using quite low settings of opacity and flow. I'll try to keep the blue of the eyes. I'll remove this at the brow and the top of the model's head. I'll remove the color in both the shoulder and the chin of the model, and after I do that, I'll turn off the vibrance adjustment layer, and you can see what we've done so far. In the places I've worked on, it'll stay black and white, so in this area, we will need to darken it slightly. I'll add yellow, some magenta, and some red in combination, and it will darken that part of the image trying to simulate colors already existing in the picture. And you can see how much better our picture is and how much more balanced it has become. The other thing I will do with the help of color balance is to add some more colors to the highlights. I'll add some cyan, magenta, and yellow. The other way you can do this is to try to select the parts that are too saturated with color using color range. Trying to select the colors which are too saturated and dark, and removing the colors which are bright and yellow and less saturated using the color ranges options. I'm going to create a new dodge and burn group to continue then I'll working use on the model to skin. soften the selection. Because the to effect so, was too intense, to I reduced it select, by a bit, modify, to obscure the part under her eye, and I'll a very little of that just part under her the lips. color range on a new layer, and now I can I'll use probably it as reduce a selection. this to 70%. Then I'll merge them together in a single to layer. This, this, I'll select it by holding down Control click on the I'll layer, probably reduce and then this I can to add 70%. a mask on any layer Then I I'll want. merge them together in a single layer by pressing Control E. I'll add a sample point on the image. I'll try to simulate the already existing colors in the hair. And since this is too strong as an effect, keep it at a very low percentage. 
and will make a combination of the two layers. This layer will be even on a lower percentage, 10% opacity and 5% fill, which will make it almost imperceptible, but still an existing effect. I'm going to create a new dodge and burn group to continue working on the model skin. We'll group them as they should be grouped together, to create an overall organization in the working file, and use a brush with a hardness of 50% to reinforce slightly under the eyes. and create a new empty layer which we'll put on color. Using the stamp tool on an empty layer set on color, you don't add texture but only colors, which are existing in the image, because the layer can only contain colors because of its blending option selected. This is way better than to select a solid color and paint directly on the skin with a brush, because with the brush, you can select only one solid color, but with the stamp, as I said, you copy already existing colors from the image. Both methods work, just try which can help you achieve better results in your case. And everything I've done so far I'll group so I can see it all. I'm going to create a new empty layer on the color blending option. and try to select similar colors which already exist from around this part of the image to blend them nicely. I'm selecting the existing colors with the Alt and using the brush at very low percentage to add some more colors, very gently. And the other thing I'm going to do is to select that area of the photo, duplicate the selected part of the image, then I'll strengthen the reds in the image. I'll put on a black mask and that way I'll reveal only where it seems necessary to remove these yellow areas around her chin and her mouth. Carefully, so I can remove any existing edges, because as you saw, I duplicated only a small part of the image, and if I reveal too much, I may end up with edges and color differences, and we don't want that. Currently, we're only removing some of the yellow that's in the area around the mouth. So at first glance, it looks too red, but in the end, we'll balance that part. And bring it all together in one layer. Then, I'll create a new layer of color and add a little more red under the eyes. Don't use a brush, use stamp to add color which already exists in the photo. And then I'll combine these two layers into one.
The next thing I'll do is to create another group of dodge and burn. using a brush with hardness 50%. And I will enhance these freckles under the eyes of the model, because as you can see, as a result of the retouching process, we've lost some of the details of her freckles. We'll fix that now. Not to look like it's been touched up, but to recreate the already existing original details. That's the main reason, as I said earlier, that the frequency separation technique is not a great choice for that photograph, because freckles can easily blend with the other parts of the skin, and you lose them as an effect. I'll try to simulate the already existing freckles as much as I can by gently darkening the spots I think where they can exist, or by repeating over the blended freckles. We use opacity of 40% and flow at 2%. I'll increase these here on that area, some more here, and a bit more here. I'll add a little bit more here as well. And it seems nice to me already. And that which I have at the moment, done with effects, will go down a little percentage. Maybe I'll back off some of the effect using this very soft black brush. Quite often, these small, almost imperceptible effects have a very large impact on the viewer. And that which I've done so far, I'll leave at 40 to 50 percent. In this case, 48 percent. That's it for this part. I'll go back a few steps and turn off the Dodge and Burn group to see the results I've achieved so far. I'll compare the effects from afar. Maybe I'll raise the layer percentage just a tiny bit. Or maybe it will be a better idea to hide the mask and raise the percentage and brush out everything that seems too strong as an effect to me. Because I want to balance and keep the freckles under her eye stronger, and everything which is closer to the eyelid less visible. And the next thing I'll do is to crop the image. I'll use the marquee tool to select the area I want to preserve. In other words, I'll crop that part of the image I don't want to keep. And choose a value ratio of 3 to 4. I choose how it will look while respecting this rule of thirds and will use the crop tool to crop. Otherwise, if automatic, it'll cut out some parts which I don't want to cut. At the moment, I can see that there's a little difference between the face and the shoulder area because the face is red and the shoulder is yellowish and I want to make them uniform in color. The next thing I'll do is to create another copy by merging everything together on a new layer. Using the hue and saturation, I'll remove some more of the yellow, but this time I'll apply this effect on the whole image. I'll make a mask to hide the layer and reveal only where I want to change the color from yellow to red to balance the color of the body and the face of our model without changing the background. The next thing I'll do is create another copy, which will collect everything I've done so far and will remove a little yellow again. I'll use a larger brush for this part.
maybe a little here. Before and after. And that's the end result.